الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Before I get into uh, today's dars, uh, I just obviously Eid is in the air, so I just want to uh, discuss one or two little points that we as a community need to be aware of. Now, obviously, I can't go into all the detail of moon sighting and what the process is uh, and all the differences that exist because that would take hours to explain. For instance, there is the fiqh behind the sighting of the moon. There is the science associated with the sighting of the moon. For example, the crescent elongation, its arc, the time the sun sets, the time the moon sets, the lag time between the moon set and the sunset. It is a very complicated science involved as well. Similarly, then you have to also have expertise in qada, which is where, how can a qada be given, a decree be given? Then also, how can a qada transfer from one country to another country? It's a very complicated science, and I've written extensively on that. So those of you who know where my websites are and my social media, I can see some smirks in the crowd, then you can go to them yourself and read them, inshallah, yourself. So I will speak generally. Speaking generally, obviously for us, it's not even Maghrib yet. I mean, already talking about Eid, you know. Eid comes after Maghrib. So first, so we are in Zohar time and people are asking, uh, you know, is it Eid tomorrow, is it Eid tomorrow? It's like we want to get rid of Ramadan, you know, like we're sick of her. That we've already spent 28, 29 days with her. With her. When's she going to go? When's Eid going to come? When's she going to come? We're looking forward to her. So, you know, we should wait. And the first thing that should happen, and this is the process, and I, as I said, I'm trying to, I, you know, I'm picking my words very carefully as a diplomat. Um, what needs to be done, obviously, the first thing is, is the place where you are living, when the sun sets, then it is Maghrib time for us. So here we are in the UK, for us it's not Maghrib time yet. So when the sun sets, it's Maghrib time. Then it is the responsibility of the local community to go out to sight the moon. We've completely given that up. You know, we've completely given that up. In our madrasa in BD3, we have actually a, a stage that we've made on top of our madrasa, and we every month go to try to sight the moon. And most of the time, yes, it's cloudy, because we live in the UK. But that doesn't mean that we should stop making that attempt to do so. If every single locality, if every single area was to do that, then we would be getting sighting reports from thousands of places across this uh, uh, country. For example, let's give an example. In, in Morocco, for instance, there are 300 sites across Morocco in which people go out to try to sight the moon. And this is the case across all the Muslim lands. It's just when we came here, a couple of times we tried to say, I couldn't see it, let's go home, yeah, it's getting dark, it's cold. And then we've kind of given that up. So it, we should be trying to revive that practice. Once news comes back that the, site, the moon has not been sighted within the UK, then we can borrow khabar from outside of UK. Only at that time. But all we do is we go inside, put on Islam channel, wait, 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 wait. Travi nishto hai. That's it, you know, like now our Sharia is based on the TV. So Sheikh TV, Mufti TV, then gives a fatwa. We don't need to ring Molana Sahib. What does Molana know? We just watch TV. TV is going to give us the answer. So the whole process is completely gone. It's completely, and this is unfortunately a sign of ignorance that's within our community. A big, major sign of ignorance that's within our community. So we need to educate ourselves. And if we educate ourselves, then we'll become more aware of the process. As I said, I'm not going to go into the differences which exist, whether it should be tomorrow, whether it should be on Wednesday, uh, and, and whether calculations can be used, can't be used, how can calculations be used, what does sumu li ru'yatihi, what aftiru li ru'yatihi mean, all this sort of thing, I don't have the time to do so. For that, I have numerous lectures on our YouTube channel, and I have numerous research papers written on that. Please read them yourself, inshallah. And maybe in the future, if you want to invite me, I'll more than happily discuss it, inshallah ta'ala as well. But today is obviously our focus on the tafsir. So we have spent, alhamdulillah, the majority of the month, and the Ramadan is still here. Uh, it will be up until Maghrib, Ramadan will be here. We have spent the great majority of this month engaging with the Quran. And engaging with the Quran is absolutely essential. I've just come back, I spent four or five days in London. I just arrived a, a, a couple of hours ago. And we spent all the four or five days engage, engaging with the Quran in a different way. 
The first, how do we engage with the Quran first? The first way that we engage with the Quran is to make sure that we're reciting the Quran correctly. That's the first thing. Now, when we're young, we put a lot of time and effort as, as elders to ensure that our children can recite the Qur'an. But unfortunately, as soon as they do khatam, instead of what khatam means that we finish the Qur'an, khatam, it means khatam. To bada chipyabaz the Qur'an uchitam after this day. I'm not going to touch it from now on. Astaghfirullah. And so, and you know, and the other thing you'll notice is when you have your bookmark or your mushaf mark, wherever you leave it, tonight, you come to it then next year in Ramadan and it will still be there. That same bookmark and the ink will be coming off the bookmark and it will be on the musaf. You'll see the color stain inside there because we won't touch it again. Khatam does not mean that that's it. After 11 years old, 12 years old, that the, the chap never picks the Quran again. It is something that we have to continuously engage with throughout the rest of our life. So we start to make the Jweed rules. Now, obviously, those of us who have studied Tajweed rules, we know there's things like lahne jalli and lahne khafi. You make a lahne jalli mistake, it's, it's haram. It is haram. So a person could be reciting the Quran and he's committing haram. He thinks he's doing a good thing. And he's committing a haram act. So the first thing one has to ensure, doesn't matter how old we are, sometimes, you know, our ego gets a little bit big and we think, oh, you know, these people are going to laugh at me or whatever. I'd rather <laughs> 20 people laugh at me. I would rather 50 people laugh at me. Then on Yom al the whole community laughs at me. The whole world laughs at me. That I spent 50 years, 60 years, 70 years not reciting the Quran properly. So the first thing is to ensure that we are reciting the Quran <clears throat> properly. Then you will start to get that feel of the Quran. Once we have engaged with the Qur'an at that level, the next thing we should try to do is try to understand what the Qur'an is saying. I've had both opportunities where I've stood in Taraweeh and I've not understood a word the Imam has said. And Alhamdulillah, over the years now, I've been very fortunate that I stand behind the Imam and I understand every word he's saying. I sometimes get shocked at myself that how did I stand for an hour and a half, two hours and not understand a word the Imam was saying? How did I do it? It must take a lot of conviction, a lot of strength to stand for an hour and a half, two hours and not have an idea what the Imam is saying. And to do that for one year is excusable. To do that for two years is excusable. To be doing it for 20, 30, 40 years in a row is not excusable. So we should try to understand the basic meaning of the ayats at least. I read somewhere and I've, and I've got the actual PDF, I sent it to uh, Arshid, that there are approximately uh, 2,000 words in the Quran which if you learn them, memorize them, then 80% of the mushaf you'll be able to understand. 80%. Now 2,000 words is nothing. It's 365 days in a year. You work out the calculation. It's not that much. Two, three words a day you can learn in a year. But do we really want to? Have we really got the desire, the passion to want to do that? So that's the next stage that we should do that. And finally then, we start getting into the meaning. So let's start with one. We'll start with Al-Hakum takathur So Al-Hakum takathur meaning your takathur takathur is what we do, is copying, the, you know, uh, the, looking at somebody else, seeing what he has, competing with him. So takathur is mutual rivalry. When you are trying to rival with one another. I build a house with a small extension, my brother builds a house with a slightly bigger extension. So I think, what's he playing now? So I build the one with a little extension on top of the extension. So he does one on top of that one. So I then raise it to the ground and build a mansion. He then goes, buys three houses and turns it into a mansion. So all my life, all I'm going to do is compete with my brother. I forget the true reality of this world and I'm preoccupied with this. And this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa says. He says, al haqum takathu. The mutual rivalry has diverted your attention from the real task, what your real job was, what your real aim was in this life, this has preoccupied you. Hatta zurtumul maqabir, until you visit the grave. <coughs> now can you imagine standing in salah and listening to the Qurra and understanding these words? Is that not gonna move your heart? Is that not gonna make you think what, you, what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Rather they will soon know or Indeed they will soon know If only they knew the knowledge of certainty If they were sure 
ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ And then they will be asked on that great day regarding all the na'im, all the bliss and the delights and all the maza that they tasted and enjoyed. They will be asked about it. Every single enjoyment, every single excitement, every single benefit that they achieve, they will be asked about it. They will not be allowed to move from that spot until they're given account for it. Now, when we spend some time, now obviously I'm moving at some pace. But if we sat down and started to see that, hold on, is this ver who is this verse, who, who, who is this surah addressed to? There will be not a single person in this room that can say that it's not addressed to me. That it applies to me in some way. That if I'm not competing with my family, if I'm not competing with my neighbors, if I'm not competing with my friends, then in some other way, I'm doing it through my children. Or I'm doing it through this, or I'm doing it through that. In some way or another, we're preoccupied with this continuous mutual rivalry. Whatever car I have, I need to have a better car. I need to have this. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes off in time. He takes qasam in time. Innal insana lafi khus. Indeed, mankind is in loss. He's continuously losing. He's continuously not gaining and he's in this perpetually. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then excludes some people. He says, Illa ladina amanu. Except those who believe. Wa amilu salihat. And they do good deeds. So belief is not enough. They have to then follow that up with good deeds. Watawaso bil haq, watawaso bil sabr. And they enjoin upon another the haq. So you see somebody doing something, brother, that's not what we should be doing. That's not right. You're lying or you're, you're doing this or you're, 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 you know, whatever the brother is involved in. And likewise, he reminds us, this is tawaso. So we can't, we can't say, oh, okay, let me just chop that bit off and let me just get, I'll believe in that part of the Quran and I ignore the rest of it. We can't do that. We have to accept every single ayat, every single verse and see how this Quran is speaking to me right now. So what is it we're doing? So if we're not doing good deeds, if we're not enjoying good with on one another, if we're not enjoying patience on one another, then we must be in in the insan the fikhus. If we're not in that part, if we're not in that group, if we're not doing those activities, then we must be not excluded from that first group. And if we're not excluded from that first group, then we're part of that first group. So we have to be concerned. You see, it's okay understanding the verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has threatened us as well, as you saw in many other places. Furthermore, Bismillah ar-Rahmanir Wailul lekulli humazatil lumaza. Woe be to that backbiter, whisperer. Alladhi jama'a malu wa addada. The person who gathers his wealth, all he's busy doing is more, 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 more. How can I get more money? How can I gather more? And then he's counting it. There's ten gram there. There's twenty gram there. Whatever there. In his various bank accounts. That's all he's concerned about. Yahsabu anna malahu akhlada. He thinks his wealth will give him immortality. He thinks he's going to spend this 50 grand. He thinks he's going you know, to live off this, all this money. What does he fail to realize is he's going to die tomorrow. And then all his kids are going to fight over that money. So he thinks it's his. He thinks because I'm rich, because I'm independent, because I have this power, I have this wealth, that this will keep me alive forever. What he fails to realize is that's not keeping him alive forever. He'll be thrown into the crushing fire. And what would inform you what this fire is? This kindled fire. The one which leaps out upon the hearts. It reaches out for the person. Indeed upon them it will be closed. And the pillars there will be stretched out. So this fire, this, this is not fairy tales. This is not about something that we're being told about. Hopefully you've been attending the other gatherings. And in the other gatherings, I explained some scientific phenomena to you, which could not have been known to a man 1400 years ago. Unless the being that created that phenomena was describing them to him. Now, if Rasulullah told about certain things which we now know to be true, we now have deduced to be real, then these things, just because we have not seen them, we must accept them as well. 
if we know a truthful brother and everything he's ever said is truthful every time we've come across him he's always spoke the truth if he was to run in here right now and say quickly guys quickly guys there's 50 guys out there beating the sister up every single one of us would get up and go why because we know this brother always tells the truth so when Rasulullah has been known as Al Amin, the trustworthy, this is by the Kuffar, by the Mushrikeen, if he's known to be the trustworthy one, then whatever he says, we should also accept that which we haven't yet learned is truth. Because we're still alive. It's only when we die we will know these things. <laughs> and then we have Alam Tara Kaifa Fa'ala Rabbuka bi Ashabil Field. Do you not see how your Rabb dealt with the people of the elephants? Alam yaj'al kaydahum fi tadlil. Did he not make their efforts and their plan in deviation? Wa asala alayhim toyran ababil. And he sent against them birds in flocks. Tarmihim bi hijaratim min sijil. Who these birds cast upon them this big clay. Fajalahum ka asfim makul. And they then became like consumed, eaten up stalks. Who were the people of the elephant? Where did these birds come from? There's so much in the Quran that we don't know. And I'm not even going to share that with you. So now when this, we're going to stay in this ignorance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us something. But we're not, because we, we're not reading it, we're not finding out about it, we will never know. What we're going to do, we're going to wait now till next Ramadan before we have some scholar come and explain this to us. Or are we going to have a little bit of uh, desire ourselves, a little bit of enthusiasm ourselves, and hold on, what was he talking about? Let me find out what, what it is, who were these, where did these elephants come from? Who was attacked? What was destroyed? Why is Allah Subhanahu wa sharing this story? It's one of the surahs that we recite quite regularly. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Li fi Quraysh. For the protection of Quraysh. Now, who were Quraysh? Now, we know something that they may have been the tribe which the Prophet came from. Who was this tribe? What were they doing? Ilafihim rihla tashita'i wa saif. They're traveling that they would take or they would be protected during their traveling or during the winter and in the summer. So worship the nurturer, the Lord of this house, Yani Al Kaaba, the one who feeds them from hunger, and protects them from fear or safeguards them, gives them security. Again, just these ayats alone, books are it man. There are tafasil which are 20 to 30 volumes long. 20 to 30 volumes tafasil. There are dozens of dozens of reputable, respected tafasil which ulama have spent decades writing. We will struggle to name them. Never mind, read them. We will struggle to name them. And then we say we don't have time. And then we say that we don't, you know, that we don't engage. We have to put something in our life in order for that to happen. We have to have some dedicated time in order for that to happen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ar'ayta alladhi yukadhibu bid-deen. Do you see those individuals who deny the deen? Fadhalika alladhi yadu'u al-yatim. They repulse, they turn away the orphan. Wala yuhuddu ala tu'am al-miskeen. And they discourage the feeding of the poor فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُسَلِّينَ So war to the musallim War to the worshippers, the ones who are praying Not the ones who aren't praying War to the ones who are praying أَلَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِمْ سَاهُونَ They are those individuals who regarding their prayer are forgetful أَلَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاؤُونَ They do deeds in order to be seen They do deeds in order to be seen they're not actually doing deeds for the worship of allah they're doing deeds so other people can say oh this brother is so generous this brother stands in uh, prayer all night this brother is like this this brother is like that he wants status he wants reputation so if you worship allah then you are worshiping allah but if you worship for the sake of somebody else then you're worshiping for him so you are ascribing partners with allah you are ascribing partners with allah which is shirk and shirk is something which is never forgiven. This is the danger. So when we are praying, we should pray. This is why you notice in Salah, for example, the Sunnah Muakkada, we are stressed to pray them at home. The Nawafil, we are stressed to pray them at home. The only prayer which is recommended to pray in Jama'ah is the Fard prayer. Why? Because that's completely controlled by one person. If I want to say that, you know what? I'm going to go into a really long sajda. 
because Sidji's watching me, and I want to show to him that I'm a really pious guy. So I'm going to go into a really long sajda. So out of the corner of my eye, I'm looking, I can see Sidji looking at me, and Sidji's going, oi, oi. I'm just really very big time, man. He has not even moved from that sajda. I hope he's still alive. Maybe the fast is getting to him. And he's watching, and then he's nudging slowly. I say, check, I'm Jira, man. He's been like Sajid for like five minutes, and I'm looking as well, thinking, Alhamdulillah. The brother's watching. So am I praying to Allah, or am I praying for Sajid? Who am I praying for? So therefore, in the Fard Salah, it's controlled by one person. So he dictates the length of Ruku. He dictates the length of the Sajda. He dictates the Qira'ah. We have to follow. But where we have a say, Sunnah Muakkad and Nafal, we are recommended to pray them in privacy. Nobody's watching you. Pray them at home. There's a possibility that we could be doing it because Riyah is one of those things which is hidden. It tricks us, it fools us. We think we're not doing something in Riyah, we actually are doing something in Riyah. So this is, again, we would only get this when we're reflecting over this, you know, looking after the poor, trying to do things for them, not just praying out of sort of laziness, uh, out of lethargy, out of a carefree attitude. Forget about those people who aren't praying. Forget about those people who aren't praying. Allah SWT has not even addressed them. وَيَمْنَعُونَ al ma'un, And they stop any kindness. They stop anything that wants, wants to do a kindness, they stop them. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَا كَالْكَوْثَرِ Indeed, we have given you al-kawthar. Al-kawthar is a fountain. فَصُلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْهَرِ So pray to your Rabb and slaughter animals. إِنَّ شَانِئَكَ هُوَ الْأَبْذَرِ It is your hater that will be the one who will be cut off. Because his hater, Rasulullah's hater, used to laugh at the Messenger of Allah. He used to say, How can you be the chosen one when Allah is not giving you any sons? How are you going to be the chosen one? The sign where a man is blessed is he has sons. That's a sign of his blessing. You have none. And he said, Nobody will carry the name Muhammad. So to console, and this shows a love that Allah subhanahu had for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To console the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That don't worry, he says, I'm giving you al kawthar <laughs> And now we find, I hope that's not how everybody feels. Uh, and now we find, and now we find that every single Muslim boy that is born, what name does the parent give him? Muhammad. So the very one that the enemy of Rasulullah said that no boy will carry your name, every Muslim boy has the name Muhammad. Sometimes he's called Muhammad Muhammad. His first name is Muhammad and his surname is Muhammad. The point is that the enemy of Rasulullah was trying to make a point to him. But when you have Allah, when you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as on your defense, as your protector, as your wali, as the one that you as give your wakil, as you transfer, you do tawakkal upon him, you transfer all your, you do tafweed, yani you hand over your affairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how to look after you. Kul ya al kafirun, la a'budu ma ta'budun. So here's a clear distinction which is made between our faith and every other faith. There are things which we can share, obviously, with other faiths and no faiths. For example, we all respect honesty. We all respect fairness, justice, kindness, forgiveness. These are traits and qualities you'll find amongst Christians, Jews, atheists, and everybody. We share those. But there's certain aspects which is part of our identity, which is our faith, which makes us different than everybody else. And therefore, we should continue to stay different. In this way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses and he says, say to the uh, kafirun, Kul ya al kafirun. La abudu ma ta'budun. I will not worship that which you worship. Wala antum abiduna ma abud. And neither will you worship what I worship. Wala an abidun ma abatum. Wala antum abiduna ma abud. Lakum dinakum waliyadin. Nice and simple. For you is your religion, and for me is my religion. Don't start telling me that LGBTI is acceptable with Islam. You're not here to tell me what my religion tells me. I will follow what my religion tells me. If you think it's acceptable in your religion, that's fine. That's your choice. But it's don't enforce it on me. That does mean that I will not be, I will be intolerant, or I will be disrespectful, or I will be aggressive, or whatever. That's your choice, that's your life. Fine, you're happy with it, go for it. But don't then try to say that, oh, Islam also allows it, or there's scope for it here, or there's this. Don't change Islam. Leave Islam alone. Whatever a Muslim does, that's his problem. Leave Islam alone. Islam is itself in its pristine, pure state. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ida jaa nasrullahi wal-fath. 
when the help of Allah comes and the victory comes. And you see the people entering into the religion of Allah in large groups. Then glorify with the praise of your Rabb and seek his forgiveness. Indeed, he is oft repenting. And there's so many things I could mention again about this ayah. When this was revealed, Sayyidina Abu Bakr was the one who cried at this. And many of the younger Sahaba could not understand why he was crying. So when they asked him, they said, this is, and the Rasulullah then explained, that I have been given this choice. And now the choice I've been given is I am going to leave this earth. And hence, this was understood from the last part of the ayah, that when Islam becomes so powerful and the victory is granted and Makkah is conquered, this is where the Fath comes from. Makkah was conquered. Rasulullah was literally the king of the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. The only time in his life where he could relax. The only time in his life where he could sit back and enjoy what would come his way. Because up until that time, since the day he was born, in the absence of his father, the loss of his mother, the loss of his grandfather, the loss of his children that he's had to bury, the loss of his wife, the loss of his uncle, the, de the loss of his other uncle in jihad, all the things around him he lost through great difficulty and pain, seeing his Sahaba being tortured in front of his very eyes in Mecca and having to bear with it even though he's upon hot. To bite his lip, to keep consoling the, uh, the Muslims and saying, don't worry, the good times will come, the good times will come, be patient, be patient. To go into battle unarmed, untrained against a greater enemy. All these things the Prophet ﷺ bore with patience and accepted them. The time when victory came, the time when all the doors had opened to Rasulullah where he could live as a king, where he could live in a great state, but he never was for the dunya. He never wanted the dunya. This was not something he came for. This is something he had to be sent in order to bring the light into this world. He brought the light. He saw his Sahaba. It mentions that when he was ill in the last few days, he had, there was a curtain drawn in the room where he was in. And he turned the curtain to see if the Sahaba would be praying. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr was leading and all the Sahaba were praying. He had a smile on his face that he knew his work was done. His work was done. They can now live without him. The companions can now live without him. And they also, the companions, the greatest human beings that have ever surrounded a Nabi, they took that task and then they spread it like wildfire. Individuals that we have never ever seen since. Such bravery, such honor, and such knowledge that they would carry on going. They would not even return to go back home until the angel of death came to take their soul and there you will find their resting place. That's why you find Sahaba adopted so far away from Medina. Because their work was to spread the deen. It wasn't to sit back and relax and enjoy life. That's Jannah. That's where we can sit back and relax and enjoy life. This life is for work. This life is for toil. This life is for pain. This life is to deal with things with patience. The Prophet is a fine example of that. I'm sorry. So this was addressed to Abu Lahab. May his hands be destroyed. And should not benefit him his wealth, nor what he earns. So he scared him off. He's going to think that they will burn he will burn in the fire with the flames and his wife the one who carries firewood around her neck is a rope made of twisted fiber if abu lahab wanted to prove this religion wrong all he had to do was accept islam had he accepted islam he would have revoked this ayah because he would have said, how could I be destroyed? How can I go to Jahannam if I become a Muslim? Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not even give him the tawfiq to even act as a munafiq. So these verses stood even when the opponents were alive. Never mind when the opponents are gone. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. 
لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد. There is very little we know about Allah. You know, we we we're not um, you know I'm going to use some technical terms. We're not anthropomorphists. We don't say that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is like us. Even though we hear verses of hands, even though we hear verses of this nature, we do not say that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has a form like we have a form. He is not in a space like we are in a space. Again, this is very deep kind of theology and aqaid, so really not the place for it, especially on an empty stomach. So maybe another time, inshallah. So when they asked, "Who is Allah?" You keep saying, "Allah, who is He? What What is Allah?" So He describes. He says, "Allah is ahad, is one. Allah is samad." He's eternal. Lam yalid, he does not give birth to anything. Walam yulad, and neither was he given birth to. But this last ayah encapsulates the definition of Allah. Walam yakullahu kufuwan ahad, and there is none comparable to him. Laysa kamithlihi shay. Nothing is like him. So we can't try to understand Allah using our thinking. Because our thinking is human thinking, so how can we try to understand Allah? If this thing can't understand me, when humans have created it, how can we try to understand Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala when He's created all the heavens and so it's beyond us? So we just stay within our lane, as they say. Stay within our lane, accept what He's told us, follow His commandments, and then we can ask all these interesting questions when we go to Jannah and we are sitting down, eating food, reclining and relaxing. Then we can have this discussion. For now, we have work to do. Bismillah rahman him. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falak. Say, I take refuge in the Rabb of the daybreak. Min sharri ma khalaq. From the evil that He created. Wa min sharri ghasiqin. And from the evil of the dark night. Ida waqab when it becomes dark. Women sharrin na fathati fil uqad. And from the evil women who blow on knots. Women sharri hasidin ida hasad. And from the evil of the envier when he has envy. So we have to, these are, this are a surah, the next surah, Kul Yayu al Kafirun and Surah Ikhlas are ones we should read often before we go to sleep, blow them in our palms and protect them. We don't need to tie us, you know. <laughs> I always crack jokes about Taviz, you know. Poor baby falls ill, so we try a everywhere around his body, right? Why do you recite Kullah or do we fall on the baby? Because you know, that Taviz is going to stand on the poor baby. So the baby dies in the morning. They, My God, that Taviz didn't work. Yeah, the poor baby's dead because he got strangled with the Taviz. He got caught in that thing and killed him. If Allah SWT has shown us a way, if Rasul SWT has shown us a way, then let's follow that. Ah, a person who is illiterate, back in the day, uh, when we were in villages and we couldn't speak uh, any Arabic, then yes, the ulama would write and give it to the person and say, take it. Now, mashallah, you know, we can start four, five, six, seven different languages. We can do all sorts of things. Surely we can learn three, four uh, surahs and wait two minutes with our child whilst they're going to sleep and blow it upon them and blow it on the house. You know, we're literate for everything else. We've got an opinion about this and an opinion about that when it comes to salah, when it comes to this. But when it comes to this, then, oh, brother, I don't know it. And finally, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas. Say, I seek refuge in the Rabb of the people. Malikin nas, the king of the people. Ilahin nas, the god of the people. Min sharril waswas. From the evil of the whispering. Al-Khannas, the sneaky whisperer. Al-Ladhi yuwas whistle. That being that whispers in sudurin nas. In the hearts and the chests of the people. But the last part is the scary part. Min al-Jinnati. We know they are shayateen from the jinn. But also... One nas. There are shayateen in people. So if you know that there are people who are bad for you, dangerous for you, always whispering rubbish in your ear, then seek refuge and break your company. It's easy to get scared of jinn because they're different than us. So we always say, oh, be careful from jinn, be careful from jinn. The most scary one is, as we say, is the wolf in sheep's clothing. Because what you do with a wolf that's in sheep's clothing, you let it come a bit nearer to you. It's only then that he shows you his true colors, jumps on you, and then you've had it. But when you see something quite scary like a jinn, not that I've seen a jinn, but if you were to see, I'm assuming they're quite scary. I don't want to offend any jinn if there's some jinns out here. I think you're all good. But if you do, if you were to uh, see a jinn, you would probably get scared. But the scary one is those people around us who are committing these bad acts and continuously encouraging us to do exactly the same. These are the ones we must seek refuge from. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين ما الله سبحانه وتعالى accept 
our efforts that we have put in throughout this month. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our salah, may he accept our qiyam, may he accept our tilawah, may he also accept our fast. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any errors that we have made, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please forgive us and overlook them. We are weak and we are useless and we could even though as much as effort as we make, we will make mistakes. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything good that's come from us, then we know that that's come from our teachers and from our scholars. May Allah accept them. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, accept our ulama who strive in your path in order to try to educate and pass on the information that they possess. Ameen. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, keep the massages like Masjid Bilal and other massages in Bradford and beyond alive and beating like a strong heart without our massages we are lost we are lost sheep the masjid is a place that's going to keep your deen alive and it's going to keep you alive you separate from the masjid and we're destroyed so ya allah keep these masajids open our madaris ya allah subhanahu wa that protects our iman our islamic idaras their looms ya allah subhanahu wa protect them all we know that we have the enemies that see them with wicked eyes and with evil eyes ya allah subhanahu wa blind them and safeguard us from their hands ya allah wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alamin Subhanakum wa bihamdika shalwa Allah ilan ta astaghfiru wa tawatubu alayka assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.